everyone. My name is Andrew Willis. And on behalf of the Chicago Kent Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society, we want to welcome you to this debate on some of the most pressing issues today regarding LGBT equality and religious liberty. We have two excellent speakers today. Our first is Ilya Shapiro. He is a senior fellow in constitutional studies at the Cato Institute and the editor-in-chief of the Cato Supreme Court Review. Before joining Cato, he was a special advisor to the multinational force in Iraq and practiced at the firms Patton Boggs and Clearly Gottlieb. He has testified before Congress and state legislatures and has served as the Cato's, served as coordinator for the Cato's amicus brief program, which has filed over 300 Friends of the Court briefs in the Supreme Court. He has clerked for the Judge E. Grade, Grady Jolly of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. He holds degrees from Princeton University, the London School of Economics, and received his JD from the University of Chicago Law School. Our second speaker is our own Professor Anthony Kreis. Professor Kreis has joined Chicago, the Chicago Kent faculty in 2016. He previously taught at the University of Georgia, Georgia State University, and was a visiting scholar at the, at the Emory University School of Law. Professor Kreis's research has focused on the law's treatment of vulnerable persons, especially in respect to LGBT individuals. He is active in law reform efforts. Professor Kreis has served as a consultant on cases and legislation relating to same-sex marriage and has testified numerous times before the Georgia General Assembly. He received his bachelor's degrees from the University of North Carolina, a JD from the Washington and Lee University School of Law, and a PhD from the University of Georgia. We'll begin with 15-minute presentations, followed by a five-minute rebuttal, with the remaining time left for question and answers. And just so you all know, this is being recorded by CAN TV. So for the question and answers, we ask that you go and step behind that mic right there for the recording and to ask your questions. So without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Ilya Shapiro. Well, thanks very much for having me. It's, uh, it's good to be back. It's uh, not my first time speaking here, so I'm glad I don't wear out my welcome. Um, you know, I think this is, we might disagree on the specifics, but I'm, I'm hoping that we can find some sort of consensus on the theory of the matter. Uh, and that is that there really doesn't have to be a conflict between religious liberty and LGBT rights, or, or any rights uh, in general. Um, and that's, bec that's uh, so long as we uh, understand the distinction between public and private actors. Uh, in other words, uh, going to political theory 101, when we all uh, give up some of our sovereignty from the state of nature and give it to the government and empower it to do certain things, as the Constitution does which, with its uh, list of uh, uh, enumerated and therefore uh, finite uh, powers, um, we have to make sure that the government treats each of us uh, the same way, uh, treats us uh, fairly according to uh, giving the same uh, natural and, and civil rights that, that we all uh, have as, as citizens, as people. Uh, but when private actors, whether individuals or, or groups, whether they be commercial or not, whether they be uh, organized as partnerships or sole proprietorships or corporations or anything else, uh, they have leeway. They are not uh, the government, and so the government bears uh, a higher burden when it has to, uh, when it wants to force uh, private individuals, uh, again, individually or or as groups, uh, to uh, to do something. Uh, and this is the um, philosophical background on which uh, Cato certainly operates in, in a whole host of areas. We are the only organization, and I'm the only lawyer, to have signed briefs supporting Jim Obergefell and others in the fight for uh, uh, same-sex marriage rights, uh, as well as uh, Jack Phillips and uh, Elaine Wilcock and, and those who are uh, wedding vendors and, and others who are uh, objecting to being forced to participate in same-sex uh, weddings. So to be clear, uh, I'm against uh, Kim Davis and any government official who uh, doesn't want to comply with uh, equal treatment by the government, and I'm for anyone who doesn't want to bend the knee to prevailing political orthodoxies as a private uh, actor. And indeed, that's what uh, Justice Kennedy said in his opinion in Obergefell. 
Uh, we can quibble about the, the rule of decision there. Was it equal protection, due process, equal dignity, who knows? Uh, but he did uh, have uh, some instructions about uh, this supposed clash that we're talking about today. Quote, many who deem same-sex marriage to be wrong reach that conclusion based on decent and honorable religious or philosophical premises, and neither they nor their beliefs are disparaged here. Indeed, many people want to make these wedding cases and others, uh, adoption agencies or what have you, about bigotry and civil rights, about the next step to equality for a persecuted minority. Well, if we take Obergefell seriously, uh, and I certainly cheered its results, um, then this isn't about bigotry or even whether society has to tolerate distasteful views. Uh, but instead, these are cases about uh, civil rights, uh, well indeed they, these are cases about civil rights for persecuted minorities, those being the very few American small businesses who can't bring themselves to support same-sex uh, weddings. More fundamentally, it's about the freedom of speech and conscience and recognizing that the awesome force of government shouldn't be brought to bear stamping out dissenting views. Uh, as Kennedy wrote in Obergefell, it must be emphasized that religions and those who adhere to religious doctrines may continue to advocate with utmost sincere conviction that by divine precept, same-sex marriage should not be condoned. The First Amendment ensures that religious organizations and persons are given proper protection as they seek to teach the principles that are so fulfilling and so central to their lives and faiths and to their own deep aspirations to continue the family structure they have long revered. The same is true of those who oppose same-sex marriage for other reasons. Okay? So um, religious objections or others uh, are not get out of jail free cards uh, uh, or, or the ultimate trump card to any particular law. If you have a religious objection to paying taxes, you don't get, even, even under the Religious Freedom Re Restoration Act, federal or state, uh, you don't get to uh, avoid paying taxes. Uh, if you object to uh, hiring someone because of their race or their sex or other protected categories, uh, you don't get away, uh, you don't get out of that law by having a religious uh, objection. Uh, why? Because there's no other way to accomplish the goal of preventing uh, employment discrimination, for example, uh, or uh, uh, funding the government in the, in the case of, uh, of taxes. But uh, like the system with the Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, that we talked about in Hobby Lobby and Little Sisters of the Poor, we can go into those. I didn't want to make this a, a broader debate about uh, you know, the role of religion in the public square or what have you. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, government only gets to use force when uh, uh, there's no other way for it to achieve um, a very important goal and um, it's, it's tailored the, the means that it uses to its ends. And in fact, I wrote an article a few years ago uh, cheekily advocating for an omnibus Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, that is, I mean, my, my view of the Constitution is the government doesn't get to do anything. Uh, that, that would impinge others' rights unless it's absolutely necessary. That's kind of a broader discussion of, of constitutional theory. Uh, but in the context of religion, I agree, look, with the uh, Employment Division versus Smith, which says that if there's a broad, generally applicable law, you don't get an exemption uh, if it incidentally burdens religion. I also, however, favor as a matter of policy Religious Freedom Restoration Acts uh, to give those uh, exemptions, again, uh, unless uh, there's no other way of accomplishing uh, the goal. In the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, which might be different from some of these other wedding vendor cases, there are questions of uh, religious animus by the government actors on the Civil Rights Commission in Colorado. Uh, there are questions of, of equal protection, of whether the commission uh, has applied these laws the same way in, in the reverse scenario where atheist bakers would not uh, uh, do cakes that have religious meanings and, and things like that. Those are specific cases. It doesn't address the, the broader issue of uh, compelling uh, either sale or speech or, or what have you. In the case of speech, in the case of expression, um, as Justice Jackson wrote in West Virginia versus Barnett, if there's any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official high or petty can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. Indeed, the court has never um, uh, allowed or compelled uh, or, or allowed the compulsion or, 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 or compelled itself expression even where there are dignitary harms, meaning people uh, feeling slighted. Um, 
so uh, in, in, in the cases of the wedding vendors, I think you have to treat them differently uh, if there are expressive types of businesses or activities versus non-expressive. Uh, and uh, so for example, wedding singers uh, or photographers or uh, writers, if you're putting out press releases or printing up banners or things like this, uh, I think uh, you know, traditionally recognized uh, artistic or creative uh, expression uh, uh, should be safe uh, on First Amendment free speech grounds, not, not religion. Uh, conversely, if you're a caterer or a limo driver, you don't get that protection. And now florists and bakers are obviously somewhere in the middle. Uh, and there's a, a rich debate about you know, how expressive they are, whether they're expressive. You know, courts uh, obviously do protect symbolic speech of various kinds, whether it's exotic dancing or flag burning or tattooing or uh, lots of other things uh, uh, like that. There was a, one of the best briefs, possibly the best brief of Masterpiece Cake Shop, uh, was one filed by bakers in support of neither party, just illustrating literally 27 colored pictures of their artistic creation. I think it's not even a close call for me with respect to baking, at least, that uh, you don't lose free speech protection uh, for sculpting with uh, buttercream and fondant rather than marble uh, and clay. So, so this, to me, is a, is a compelled speech case, and you go look at um, uh, uh, the Woolley versus Maynard, the, the New, New Hampshire uh, license plate, live free or die, you can't be compelled to carry that. All that line of cases, and, and as I said, uh, the Supreme Court has never countenanced uh, compelled expression as a remedy for uh, any kind uh, of wrong. Uh, and if you doubt whether cakes uh, indeed can be expressive, uh, think about the different messages that cakes can have. Um, uh, a Latin cross uh, for a Lutheran church might mean different than, than one uh, that the same wood sculptor makes uh, for an Aryan Nations event. A rainbow design for a children's event has a different meaning than for uh, a gay pride festival. Um, Democratic bakers who make, make elephants for kids might have no problem, but if they're asked to do uh, something like that for a, a Trump rally, uh, they, they might uh, object. During oral argument in Masterpiece Cake Shop, Justice Alito talked about someone having a birthday <coughs> on November 9th uh, and uh, uh, wanting a cake that says, uh, you know, November 9th is the best day ever. Well, what if that cake is, same cake is being commissioned by someone who wants to celebrate Kristallnacht? So again, context matters, and uh, the, the, the person who's doing the, uh, the expressive or, or uh, uh, business um, uh, having to work towards a particular goal is, is uh, I think, uh, offensive of, of, of his or her rights uh, to do so. And then once you accept that expressive activity can be protected, and, and courts uh, police that expressive, non-expressive line all the time, then it's just a matter of uh, line drawing. Uh, well, what about the non-expressive objections, be they, again, religious uh, or otherwise? Um, I think under existing law that would be tough, but fundamentally I think government doesn't have to do this. We don't live in the world of Jim Crow where there's state-supported segregation um, with the violence uh, in the offing, there's cultural and social uh, uh, racism and, and bigotry. Here we have quite the reverse, a minority of businesses who lack market power take an unpopular position. Justice Sotomayor, uh, during oral argument, talked about a, a remote military base, say, where there might be only one bakery. What happens there? Well, the same thing that happens for why we have public accommodations law in the first place, going back to ancient common law uh, in England with travelers and, and, and public inns, today's restaurants and, and uh, hotels, kind of similar to Ollie's Barbecue and, and Heart of Atlanta Motel from the Civil Rights era. Uh, yeah, if there's no other way for you to get uh, your sustenance or a place to sleep, then that's a different situation than where in Albuquerque there are uh, over 100 wedding photographers, for example, and the next closest bakery that advertised weddings for gay uh, wedding, uh, cakes for gay weddings in, uh, in Denver was less than a tenth of a mile away in this case. Again, these are not cases of refusal to serve a particular class of people. There's not that analogy to Piggy Park and some of the other civil rights era cases. Uh, all of these wedding vendors that have come out, otherwise we would have heard about them, have no problem and have in the past had uh, LGBT clientele. They simply don't want to make something specific. Uh, to a wedding. So the broader picture here is that a ruling for Colorado or for the state governments 
uh, in these other uh, wedding cases would mean uh, a parade of horribles, sometimes even a, little, a literal parade of horribles. For example, must a Catholic artist make let's celebrate party favors for divorces? How about a Muslim uh, graphic designer? Must uh, he make flyers saying uh, one true God uh, for Jews? Should gay bakers be forced to bake cakes for, Westboro, for the Westboro Baptist Church? Uh, religion, of course, is a protected uh, category. Ideology is a protected category in many municipalities around the country. Um, what about DC think tanks? In, in DC, ideology is a protected category. I still don't understand how you know the, the liberals, the conservatives, the libertarians, how we can all hire based on, on ideology seemingly in violation of this. Should black bakers be forced to bake cakes for the Aryan nation? I mean, it, it goes on and on. Uh, you can have kind of funny examples. Fundamentally, there's a difference between denying service to certain kinds of people and declining to convey a particular message. Now, I don't know why you'd even want uh, to have as a wedding vendor someone who can't in good faith, literally, support your union. If progressives respect diversity, then shouldn't they refrain from bending the will of fellow Americans to prevailing pieties? And this goes beyond gay weddings, as it does our debate. Through an ever-growing list of mandates and regulations, government compulsions squeeze out civil society and foment social classes. clashes. Look at the battle over the Little Sisters of the Poor, when even after the Supreme Court told the government to compromise, certain states continue to want to force nuns to subvert their religious beliefs. Why? Why? The most basic principle of a free society is that the government can't willy-nilly force people to do things that violate their beliefs. Now, some may argue that there's a conflict here between religious freedom and gay rights, uh, and marriage equality is more important, but that's a false choice, as President Obama uh, would have said. There's no clash of individual rights in any circumstance other than when the government itself declines to consistently recognize and protect everyone's rights. And so county clerks on the state's behalf uh, must issue marriage licenses regardless of personal beliefs, but bakers are not government agents and so have to, uh, should be able to maintain freedom of conscience. We may wish that all people could agree that a decision by two people to commit to one another should be celebrated. Uh, I certainly agree with that, uh, and that no creed would seek to deny such a union. But above all, our constitutional system protects matters of conscience, and it's not up to the state to dictate individual beliefs. Now, Justice Kennedy, I'll finish with this, Justice Kennedy could have forestalled some of this mischief by making it clear in Obergefell uh, that, uh, uh, that that ruling protects not just the right to advocate and teach religion, but also to exercise it, and that regardless, people on either side of the debate shouldn't be forced to convey messages they don't like. But he didn't. So it's left to the better angels of our pluralistic uh, nature to respect views and lifestyles that we might not like. Thanks. All right. Well, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank, I want to thank Mr. Shapiro for, for coming out to uh, this event and joining us at Kent today. Um, and also want to thank the uh, Federal Society and the American Constitution Society for hosting it, and particularly to uh, Andrew Willis for, for making it come together and conceiving it from its inception. So first, I, I want to talk about uh, and tackle what this, this deeply contested issue from kind of a 40,000 foot level um, and talk about for-profit businesses and LGBT rights more generally and then drill down uh, into the more specific questions of same-sex marriage and discrimination in the public square. I think American civil rights law is on the precipice of dying a death by a thousand cuts. As the profile of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Americans continues to rise and LGBT rights expand, so does the fever pitch of a religious objector's demands for exemptions from civil rights laws that protect LGBT persons from discrimination. I think largely the tug and pull between these competing interests in, in the states has generally favored the LGBT community in recent years. However, uh, recently we've seen at least one dangerous federal court ruling which I think threatens the balance of religious liberty and civil rights. The ruling's logic threatens to gut over 50 years of civil rights gains and usher in an unprecedented age of what I think is religious supremacy. The facts in the case of EEOC versus RG and GR Harris funeral homes, I think are, it's generally straightforward. Amy Stevens, transgender woman, was a longtime employee at the RG and GR Harris funeral home in Detroit, Michigan until 2013. 
After working almost six years at the funeral home while identifying as male, Stevens informed her employer that she planned to have sex reassignment surgery. After she completed the initial medical treatment, Stevens explained to her colleagues that she would live out her authentic self as a woman. Within two weeks of that announcement, the funeral home owner terminated her employment. Stevens filed a complaint with the EEOC, claiming the funeral home violated her rights under Title VII. The EEOC agreed with Stevens, filed suit against the funeral home, alleging that the funeral home violated Title VII's prohibition against sex discrimination and that Stevens was sex stereotyped impermissibly. The federal court initially sided, the district court, sided with the EEOC, finding that gender stereotypes reflected in the policies of the funeral home ran afoul of Title VII. But, but the funeral home walked away from the district court unscathed. On the business's website, the funeral home claims uh, or tells readers that its proprietor's, quote, highest priority is to honor God in all that we do as a company and as individuals, end quote. In the same vein, one of the owners proffered that it is his sincere belief that, quote, the Bible teaches that a person's sex, whether male or female, is immutable, a God-given gift, and that it is wrong for a person to deny his or her, his or her God-given sex, end quote. In light of their religious beliefs, the funeral home claimed that a federal mandate requiring the business to adopt anti-discrimination practices for transgender employees ran afoul of the Federal Religious Freedom, of Res Freedom Restoration Act, which prohibits the federal government from substantially burdening a religious practice unless the government demonstrates a compelling interest for that burden and the government's interest cannot be achieved by less burdensome means. The court agreed. The funeral home's religious objection to transgender rights trumped Stevens' right to be free from, from discriminatory employment practices. Now, thankfully, the Sixth Circuit reversed that decision last month, holding that permitting Stevens to wear attire that reflects a conception of gender that is at odds with the funeral, homes, uh, funeral home owner's religious beliefs is not a substantial burden of religion under RIFRA. But the district courts and its arguments and arguments of its ilk that justify harming vulnerable citizens, provided the animus that victimizes them is cloaked in the garb of religious practice, I think is highly dangerous. Significant swaths of Americans hold religious beliefs that touch on basic matters of racial, religious, and sexual equality. And allowing individuals or businesses to escape mandates of anti-discrimination laws by citing their religious beliefs, both those that are sincere and those that are used as pretexts, renders civil, law, civil rights laws meaningless. Much in the debate about LGBT non-discrimination has focused on civil rights exemptions and for-profit for businesses like the Funeral Home or Arlene's Flowers or Masterpiece Cake Shop. And I think allowing accommodations for private, for-profit businesses flies in the face of our American civil rights tradition. This nation settled well over 50 years ago whether private businesses should be subjected to non-discrimination laws despite deeply held secular or religious objections. The courts did not accept Maurice Bessinger's claim to religious freedom to deny serving African-American patrons at Pig Piggy Park Barbecue in South Carolina, or Morton Rolston's purported liberty interest to deny services to patrons at the heart of Atlanta Motel. Just as there is no right to refuse to sell a barbecue sandwich to a person of color from a religious objection, or uh, to a religious objection that integration is abhorrent to God's will, there is no right to deny a cake to a same-sex couple utilizing the same complicity rationale. The only way one can make a justification for treating a baker different than a proprietor of the barbecue is if you believe LG LGBT status is a matter of choice. It is not. Our civil rights laws are not and should not be concerned with the commodity sold, but the class of persons shut out and forced to suffer dignitary harm. For again, for again, over 50 years now, this country has firmly held on to the belief that for-profit entities cannot discriminate against protected classes in ordinary commercial transactions, and our law should continue to reflect that. Now, of course, that is not to say that any and all religious exemptions are problematic. Indeed, exemptions can often laudably protect the rights of religious minorities, and they should. Take, for example, a case from the 1990s where members of the old Amish faith were fined in Wisconsin for failing to, disp to display bright orange triangles on their horse-drawn buggies. They objected on religious grounds. The Amish asserted that the colors were too loud and too bright and that they could achieve the state's interest in traffic safety using lanterns and duller reflecting tape. 
The, Amish, the Wisconsin Supreme Court, using strict scrutiny under the state's constitution, ruled in the Amish's favor. At the end of the day, safety needs were satisfied and individual religious liberty preserved without detriment to any non-adherent third parties. The exa this example illustrates a fundamental point about the nature and boundaries of religious liberty in America. Religious liberty is a shield from government, but it is not a sword to injure others. The application of federal RIFRA, state RIFRA, or state constitutional free exercise doctrine to allow businesses to escape their obligations under civil rights law uh, to not discriminate in employment, housing, or, or services, I think gives rise to serious establishment clause questions as well. The Supreme Court has articulated in establishment clause jurisprudence that religious accommodations contravene the First Amendment when they impose significant burdens on third parties whom do not receive any benefit from the accommodation. Unlike religious institutions and their nonprofit arms, for-profit businesses enjoy no right to exercise religious beliefs at the expense of others who do not share their beliefs. In the commercial sphere, if a government accommodation burdens third parties, it effectively compels those third parties to bear the cost of practicing someone else's religion. It is useful to look to other early states that enacted same-sex marriage laws prior to Obergefell to see that legislatures have done a good job at fine-tuning some exemptions for religious objectors to equal marriage rights for same-sex couples by adopting a basic rule that separates out for-profit actors and non-profit actors. Consistent with the demands of the First Amendment, every state in this time period provided religious uh, liberty protections for the clergy. Yet every state went beyond the redundant protection to give substantive insulation to these nonprofit entities as well. Although the contours of the protections hammered out between 2009 and 2013 differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, a core of exemptions emerged. For example, nine jurisdictions allowed a religiously affiliated group to refuse to provide services, accommodations, advantages, facilities, goods, or privileges for the solemnization or celebration of any marriage inconsistent with their religious beliefs. Nine jurisdictions shielded groups or persons from private civil suits for refusing to solemnize or celebrate a marriage. Eight jurisdictions gave express protections for covered groups from um, being penalized from the government for refusing to lawfully celebrate or solemnize a marriage. And seven jurisdictions extended explicit protections to benevolent religious organizations or groups that sponsored marriage retreats or housing for married individuals. I think that's all well and good. Um, however, what states by and large have refused to do and what we, what we both agree on um, is that whether, uh, is, is that clerks should not be permitted to opt out from license requirements. Um, you know, whether it's Kim Davis in Kentucky or Linda Summers in Indiana, there's been a, a lot of focus in the last few years on these, on these clerks. The term of clerk's employment is to merely process license applications. It is no more, in my view, than data entry and issuing directions. Um, you know, clerks aren't, aren't asked to offer warm congratulations or bless a marriage or endorse any couple's relationships who walk through the door. They're continue, they continue to be free to practice their faith and hold on to a belief that marriage is only between a man and a woman. They're not forced to choose between uh, their personal religious convictions or employment with the government. Um, but three states expressly allow uh, religiously affiliated adoption or foster care agencies to place children only with heterosexual married couples so long as they've received no government funding. Um, but that's a very different rule than what we've seen in the new way of legislation, which would permit taxpayer-funded adoption and foster care agencies to discriminate against prospective adoptive or foster care parents if those agencies have a religious objection to placing those children in their care. Um, now, I think this is particularly targeted towards LGBT people, but of course it could go beyond that. Whether those people, uh, those people have been divorced, whether they protect, practice a particular religion, or anything that conflicts with the agency's religious beliefs. Laws that create carve-outs for religious adoption agencies run contrary to the most fundamental principle in family law, that the best interest of children must yield to all other, all other considerations. When the state removes children from their families because of abuse or neglect, the primary consideration for placing children with foster or adoptive families and providing services to those children must be the child's needs and interests. Um, although these bills would give agencies permission to deny service to all sorts of children and families, they, um, you know, again, they are certainly there to target LGBT people and LGBT families. And as the Supreme Court noted in Obergefell, many same-sex couples raise children in loving and nurturing homes, hundreds and thousands, in fact. Um, and social science overwhelmingly concludes that children raised by same-sex couples fare just as well as their peers who are raised by heterosexual parents. 
At the end of the day, private religious views should not be situated on the same planes as vulnerable children's needs. Um, you know, adoption agency exemptions, uh, I think, also have equal protection deficiencies. Again, because they target LGBT people, but also because they signal out LGBT uh, parents and LGBT youth um, as, as, uh, you know, as being worthy um, of being discriminated against. And the law should not target people in this way. Um, you know, on the, 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 the Chief Justice uh, Berger in, in a case in the 80s once wrote that the Constitution cannot control prejudices, but it cannot tolerate them. Private biases might be well outside the reach of the law, but the law cannot directly or indirectly give them effect. And I think that's true here, as it was in a case of racial discrimination in, in that case. Laws of these kinds would have the practical effect of breathing life into private biases with state-supported institutions charged with protecting the welfare of children. Organizations that accept public money have a duty to serve all taxpayers. And I think this basic anti-discrimination principle ensures that services are freely available in the market and protect individuals from both humiliation and dignitary harm. While individuals are free to believe and speak consistent with the dictates of their religious faith, when actions, even religiously inspired, conflict with other con constitutionally protected rights, the anti-discrimination principle must prevail. While attempting to appear as one, adopting agency exemption laws and many other exemption laws like it are not actually religious accommodation law. Rather, they constitute a blunt instrument which would shift the mission of child welfare-related social services from what should be paramount, the best interests of children, towards the interests of agencies hired by the state to care for them, and it should be rejected. At the end of the day, while there are some valid reasons to insulate non-private or nonprofit actors from liability under civil rights laws, there is no merit, no merit, in permitting for-profit businesses, owner, for-profit business owners, the right to deny service to a class of persons or those accepting government funds to law of access to subsidized programs. One can only imagine the swift response that will follow if courts and legislatures open up opportunities for for-profit actors, uh, for-profit religious objectors to civil rights laws. Businesses may suddenly undergo conversions like the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, discovering religious beliefs that they never had before, and posting signs as a consequence of who they will and will they, who they will not serve. I think that is, an, that is a vision of our society that we've already rejected, and it's one we cannot embrace today. Thank you. Except we haven't seen that, uh, because we'd know. Uh, whether before or after Hobby Lobby, we'd, we'd see all sorts of pretextual claims being made. And indeed, that's the proper role of a court, to suss out whether a particular claim has been ginned up for purposes of litigation or evasion of the law, or whether it's sincere. They don't go into doctrine, you know, courts, federal and state aren't saying, oh, you're being, that, that's the improper uh, uh, interpretation of, of, of Catholic uh, doctrine or, or, or what have you, but they look to sincerity. Um, and we. We just don't see uh, uh, a lot of these uh, objectors uh, because we'd hear about them. You know, the media would would, would make it make us well known every time there's uh, whether it's a, a pizza parlor in Indiana or, or something, and we, we hear this makes national news uh, instantly. There is not a, a, a raft of private businesses who well, there's none who simply won't serve, serve gay people, so that's a that's a canard. Uh, but there's not a raft who who don't want to work gay weddings. Um, uh, why? Because it's a, it, it hurts financially, uh, as the law and economics brief uh, in the Masterpiece Cake Shop uh, case shows. It's actually advantageous in this day and age to, to advertise that you're gay friendly, let alone um, uh, say that you're not, uh, rather than staying neutral. Uh, and so the, the, the question returns to, um, are we willing to allow play in the joints, or are we going to force everyone to bend the knee uh, to prevailing orthodoxy. Um, when government funds are involved, it's a different question. Uh, and so, um, you know, I'm probably not as up on the adoption literature as Professor Kreis, um, but uh, yeah, government funds can have strings attached. At the same time, uh, if the government will only allow adoption agencies that uh, you know, will place without regard to X, Y, and Z, then that's a problem. Uh, but if it's government funding that's involved, uh, then in effect, uh, whatever uh, actor uh, is involved becomes an agent of the government. And remember my distinction between public and, uh, and private uh, action. 
So all of these things are not like uh, the Jim Crow era, not like Piggy Park, not like denial of service. Um, Jack Phillips said you could buy whatever cupcakes, birthday cakes, I'll make you a birthday cake. Uh, it's not just even the stuff that's already on the shelf. But I won't make you a Halloween cake or a bachelor party cake or uh, a divorce cake or a gay wedding cake. Uh, so it has nothing to do with the people being uh, gay themselves. For that matter, if I, who support Obergefell, wanted to get a cake support, uh, 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 celebrating the decision in that case, he wouldn't make it for me. Um, I'm surprised that the hardest case, really, that or hypothetical that comes out of this whole discussion hasn't been raised by Professor Christ, so I'll raise it myself. That's uh, interracial marriage. What if uh, this uh, wedding vendor or other service provider uh, forget about for a wedding, let's say an interracial couple comes in uh, and doesn't want to doesn't want to serve them. Uh, it's uh, th that's uh, probably the most difficult situation because I said that I would allow him to deny if he's a Catholic, you know, an evangelical Protestant or if he's a Muslim, a Jew or, or, or what have you, all of those scenarios. And the answer there is, uh, first of all, uh, I'm not aware of too many religions that uh, uh, are against uh, interracial marriage. Uh, certainly not anymore. And, and secondly, uh, in our history, in our country, um, objections to interracial relationships are intimately tied with, I would say inextricably tied to, uh, uh, ideas of racial superiority uh, and supremacy and, and, and things like that. And so uh, given the historical context, race is different in that, uh, in that uh, account. Um, but anyway, that's about the hardest case uh, that you can bring, and so, uh, as I said, uh, I wouldn't use force unless absolutely uh, necessary, and when, when you can get service down the block, um, I, I would allow for play in the joints. <clears throat> so I, I think there's a couple problems with trying to disaggregate sexual orientation from same-sex marriage. You say, oh, I will serve you um, no matter what your sexual orientation, except for in this narrow exception. Um, you know, the courts have never said that there's a status conduct distinction between sexual orientation and same-sex conduct. Um, and that's, that was true in the CLS versus Martinez case, and that's been true throughout the Supreme Court's uh, uh, gay rights jurisprudence. And I think it would make uh, little sense to say that we can disaggregate the two here. Um, I think same-sex marriage discrimination is sexual orientation discrimination, and that's, that's all I can, that's that. Um, but I also think that, there's, um, that there is something here about the, the interracial marriage case. Um, I think that we have to understand where anti-gay anti animus or anti-LGBT animus more broadly comes from. Um, it is a product of sexism. The fact of the matter is, is there's, I could do this all day, um, and, and some of you will unfortunately have to watch me give this lecture later. Um, but there is a long history of, of anti-gay animus developing as a result of kind of this toxic masculinity, that if you are gay, you are somehow equivalent to a woman and therefore um, there, there's, you know, there, there's something wrong with you. Um, and I think that if we say that interracial marriage is somehow different or racism and race discrimination is somehow different, um, then we're saying that sex discrimination generally is somehow different and a lesser evil that the government um, has, will have one hand behind its back trying to, to combat. Um, and I, I, th I, can't, I can't imagine that being the right answer. And the final, note, final thing I'll note is this. Um, you know, we often hear these examples of, well, what if the gay baker has been asked to, to produce a cake or create a cake for the Westboro Baptist Church or the, uh, you know, the Klansman asking a, the African-American baker uh, to create some kind of anti uh, you know, anti or I guess pro clan cake, and the truth of the matter is, is that as a as a you know propri proprietor, as a business owner, you can choose whatever products you want, but you have to serve that same product to the to the, to people without res uh, regard to their protected class. So you know, if that you know if that um, African American baker makes clan cakes, then they have to provide that cake to to anybody who walks through their door. If they don't make those cakes then they don't have to sell them, period, because they're not selling it to anybody. So if you make a wedding cake and you, you, know, you make wedding cakes, you have to serve and provide that cake to people regardless of what protected class uh, they're, they're a part of. Uh, there are exemptions for small businesses from certain kinds of employment regulations. I'm not sure about that one. 
Uh, and if there's not, then, uh, th then tough, because that's a class of regulation that, that, that you can't uh, avoid, you know, whether to, to, to hire or fire the employment discrimination thing. I, again, the, the policy debate we can have about whether that's, uh, that should be in place without exemptions even for, for small businesses, but I think on the law, the Sixth Circuit uh, uh, got it right. I wonder if the speakers would distinguish a situation where the baker is being asked to sell an off-the-shelf cake that's already been prepared from a special order cake that would require a special inscription. I will admit, I think the inscription might, I might have, I might have some pause to think about whether there's an issue there. I have not come on a, I haven't really decided to be quite honest on that. Uh, but I think if it's off the shelf, then it's, it's an easy, clear cut case. Uh, you have to sell it to people no matter, yep. you know, regardless of the protected class. Um, you know, I think there's a better, different, or there's a different question. Um, you know, I could see a situation where if you had a, a you know, a, uh, we'll say you have a binder full of pictures and say, I'll make this cake. You know, it's not made already, but I'll make it. I think you have to provide it. Um, you know, to me, I, I don't see too much of a difference, though, between I'll make you a, a cake that you want that's pretty plain and you know ornate or whatever, um, versus I'm actually writing something. Um, you know, I, I just I don't see I don't see much of a difference. Well, the Supreme Court does because it recognizes protections for symbolic speech uh, of various kinds. You don't need lettering. Actually, Colorado uh, is taking a consistent position and says even lettering can be required. Um, you know, this came up during oral argument. It seemed like Justice Ginsburg was even bothered by the idea that, uh, well, if someone inscribes uh, congratulations Ruth and Marty, referring to her late husband, then they have to inscribe congratulations Craig and Dave, the, the couple here. Um, but I don't think it, uh, there's a dividing line between an inscription or not. I, you know, off the shelf versus not is important because that's where denial of service w versus refusal to create something uh, comes in. And purpose matters. If someone just comes in off the street and says, I want a wedding cake out of, this, out of your list, and it's not Jack Phillips, as, as is the case here, it's not the bakers uh, accustomed to ask you know, who it's for or what kind of wedding, it just says, oh, you, I want that one, then he makes it, and then later on that person uses it for a gay wedding, there's no problem there. You, you know, Jack Phillips can't like, demand that the cake be destroyed or returned or anything like that. Uh, but uh, if he knows that it's for something that he doesn't want to participate in, um, then uh, that should be protected. It's like I gave the example of, a, of a, a, a carver, a wood carver, who's making a Latin cross. I think he should be allowed, even if he sells lots of crosses to churches, he should be allowed to decline to make that same exact wooden cross for a Klan rally. And so off the shelf versus custom uh, or uh, per contract, I think matters. So in the Masterpiece case, the uh, the discrimination that was alleged was on the basis of sexual orientation, and that's how this has progressed through. Uh, but in these sorts of cases, you know, Colorado civil rights statute protects against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. But in states that don't protect that, or really in any state, how is it that uh, Jack Phelps or any other business owner can say, I'm not going to serve you because, or I'm not going to make what you want me to make because what you're going to use it for, the message you want me to express doesn't comport with my religious beliefs. Um, how is that not imposing his religious beliefs on somebody that doesn't share them and therefore discriminatory on the basis of religion? Yeah, uh, because the, the customer doesn't have to do anything pursuant to Mr. Phillips' beliefs. Uh, he's just not getting uh, the, the, the custom product uh, that he wants, as long as it's expressive. As I said, it, it doesn't matter whether it's a religious belief. Uh, you know, it doesn't really have to give a reason, uh, in, in, in fact, uh, if uh, inexpressive activities is, is what uh, I'm arguing. If it's not expressive, then the law works differently. And I thought you were going somewhere else with your question, because, yeah, a lot of states uh, uh, don't protect sexual orientation, in which case, you know, some courts are trying to uh, fit in sexual orientation into sex discrimination. I don't think that's right. I think you need an, a new law to protect sexual orientation if you can do that, which is a, a separate discussion. But for example, even though I think the Sixth Circuit was right in the funeral home case, I think the Seventh Circuit was wrong uh, in the Zarda case in, in reading the 1962 or 72 uh, uh, statute to, to include orientation into, uh, into sex discrimination. But getting back to your larger point, um, 
Jack Phillips isn't imposing his rule, is, isn't telling someone to do something pursuant to his religion or preventing them from doing something pursuant to his religion. Uh, he is just practicing his craft and uh, uh, declining to act in, in certain ways. I think he has strong protections under the law, under, under free speech. In non-expressive businesses, as I said, there, there's lesser protections, but there should be, in my view. So my issue with this is, well, where do we draw the line? Um, because I can claim that pretty much anything I make is expressive. Now, um, you know, many of you are familiar with Wiener Circle hot dogs, right? Um, they have signs all the time about, you know, these political beliefs and, and, and moral beliefs that they hold. Um, it, can they make a, you know, an expressive hot dog? Um, can I, I mean, I love to bake. Is, you know, I, can I make, is my coconut cream pie expressive? Or is it just wedding cakes? If it's just wedding cakes, then why is it just wedding cakes? And I, have to, you know, I, I suspect that they're, uh, I think it was the DOJ's brief, uh, basically said, well, wedding cakes are very different. Um, you know, I don't, I have a problem with, with where we draw the line. I think anyone can make, try to make anything expressive as they want. Now, of course, the courts, I think, are generally equipped to, to handle, um, either to handle these situations and parse out those objections and those refusals of service, which are legitimate and sincere and those are not. But the damage has already been done at that point. So I, I think that this line drawing is, is almost impossible to do. Courts draw lines all the time. Uh, the standard here would be something like, is this a traditional form of expression that's been recognized? Uh, is there symbolic meaning uh, in context of the product? Or is it merely uh, functional? Like, for, is, it, is it primarily expressive, symbolic, or is it just for eating? Uh, I'm sure your coconut cream pies are great, but I don't know of any holiday that is celebrated specifically with coconut cream pies, whereas uh, <laughs> uh, a wedding cake, whatever form, is fraught with meaning and very expensive, not simply because it's the most delicious cake imaginable and just a delicate, you know. Um, and so that's why this would work different. Even if you think that you're Subway, right? You're all sandwich artists there. Uh, well. Um, I mean, that's kind of uh, uh, p uh, commercial puffery, uh, if you will, rather than, you know, this sub has some kind of uh, symbolic meaning. Unless, I don't know, it, uh, you know, it's not, but imagine if every opening day, we, which we just had uh, last week, right, it was traditional to have a wiener circle hot dog or something like that, and then that was you know, symbolic of an opening day party. or Maybe, but it would have to be something like that. And cor again, courts draw lines uh, all the time, it, it, uh, uh, the expressive, non-expressive, symbolic, non-symbolic, or religious pretext or not. Uh, there are lots of people who try to invoke RIFRA to get out a drug conviction saying they're part of the church of marijuana or something. Uh, and, you know, courts suss that out. But, yeah, there are long drawing issues, of course. For the record, my pies are very expressive. <laughs> I have a question. So Could you be forced to make a pie that says, go Nationals? Oh, Lord, no. That's... <laughs> Thankfully, nationals are not a protected class. <laughs> so you use the term a lot, civil rights, and my always understanding is that that's the government um, infringing on your rights, but we're talking about private businesses and private individuals. Can, is it possible for a private business to infringe on civil rights? Is it possible? Well, I mean, it depends on what your definition of civil rights is. Under the law, we have, yeah, we have civil rights laws that do apply to, um, to private businesses. That's, uh, um, you know, there's some dispute during the civil rights era about whether that's appropriate. Uh, Rand Paul got in some trouble when he went on TV, what, six years ago now, and, and talked about uh, maybe there's no justification uh, uh, for those types of laws. I think. Uh, there is justification whether, when uh, there's something like you know, state-supported segregation that codifies uh, uh, societal evil, you know, th that sort of thing. Um, uh, but uh, as I said, when there's no absolute need, then the legitimacy of government force uh, declines. So I, you know, I think that part of the issue here is, um, you know, we ha it hasn't obviously been to the level of Jim Crow by any means, but. You know, we've had state-sponsored discrimination against gay people for a long time now. I mean, uh, don't ask, don't tell. Um, you know, state same-sex marriage bans, where the federal government and state government, um, you know, or Defense Marriage Act, codified uh, anti-gay animus into law and projected uh, a message to society that uh, gay people were worthy and worthy targets of discrimination. 
Um, and I think we're still combating some of that, the elements of that. And I think that the, the, you know, these civil rights laws um, are there to help eradicate that. And I think that that's probably one of our, I would assume, uh, bigger, um, you know, more fundamental disagreements is what, what it should be the purpose and nature of, of, or I should say, why should we have civil rights laws and when should we have them? I'm perfectly fine with them um, you know, being there to combat dignitary harm, and I think that that should be sufficient. But of course, I, you know, I recognize that we've, you know, there's a lot of differences in opinion there, and that, that could probably be a whole debate in and of itself. Um, but. Um, okay, so my question is, along this argument of making cakes being a form of expression, the line seems to me to be that a cake that someone requests for their wedding, any expression that comes out of that cake is per the specifications of the customer. So they put together, let's say hypothetically, a four-tier cake to celebrate the four years that they've been together with rainbow frosting to celebrate the fact that they're two gay men and two men on top to celebrate the fact that they're two gay men. Those specifications and arguably the only expression that comes from that cake is per the customer's request. So a baker putting together the pieces pursuant to what someone else requests is doesn't have any expression from the baker himself. So I'm just curious what you think of that and whether or not you think it's important. Well, it goes to the freedom of conscience. And when you know, a, a baker is not an auto mechanic, uh, it's not just assembling various parts together. Uh, it's uh, using his skills. It's almost a Lockean conception of mix, mixing his labors with the with the ingredients uh, to produce this work. Um, I mean, it might be different if there was just some kit, like I have a two-year-old now and we have lots of these puzzles and simple toys to snap together and stuff like that. It was simply like, here's the kit, put it together. That's probably different, um, a closer call than what uh, goes into this art artisanal cake baking. But um, uh, if that's, um, you know, if that's the sort of debate that we're going to have, I think that's healthy. And indeed, Eugene Volokh and I, who have filed briefs uh, supporting the New Mexico wedding photographer, a Kentucky printer, uh, certain other cases, but we're on opposite sides of this and Arlene's flowers because of that where to draw the line. And that's great. That means that there should be a line, and we're just arguing about what gets um, uh, free speech uh, protection. But um, um, you know, my point is when you're uh, using your artistry, using your creativity to do something, um, it's not simply like taking a Betty Crocker mix and adding some, uh, some, some frosting to it or, uh, or something like that. But, uh, uh, and, and if it was just a cake, that's one thing, but for a wedding has symbolic meaning, goes towards a celebration, so all of those components uh, uh, work in. I think the complicity arguments um, trouble me because I have to ask, and I have to wonder, why is it that you know, these handful of, of bakers and florists and, and other uh, uh, you know, vendors, um, why is it that they're so concerned with same-sex couples, um, not concerned about you know, whether these people have been dating long enough, whether they're divorcees, whether they've been religious counseling for their marriage, whether they're um, you know, proper, you know, a good fit for one another. It just seems to be uniquely targeted towards same-sex couples. And that, that gives me some great concern. I would agree with you that I think that the, you know, when someone sees a wedding cake at a wedding, no one's saying, oh, wow, that baker had this really, you know, what a, what a great, you know, what a great design. You know, this reflects the baker's interests and the baker's wants and not the bride, which I think we all know is nonsense, right? The bride, if there is a bride, will, will control the, you know, the decision on that. Um, right? So that's, to me, that's, that's the essence of the cake. It's reflecting the, the styles, the taste, the interest, the personality of the couple and not the baker. Well, the same can be said about the, the wood carver making the cross for the uh, Aryan Nation rally. Um, you know, it's, it's commis you're commissioning something you know, for us. We understand it's not you. You can even have a disclaimer there saying, I object to what this is being used for. We'll put, the, we'll put it up. We'll make it clear that it's not you. But you're, you're skilled, so we want to use you. Well, but we also don't protect the Aryan Nation as a protected class. Sure, it's a religion. Or Westboro Baptist Church. Well, I mean, pick, pick something like that. I mean, we, we can... We can fight about whether they're a legitimate religion all day, too, but we don't, we, right, they're not. Um, you know, no one would say, yes, the, the Klan is a legitimate religious organization that, that can make a claim Well, there. the Westboro Baptist Church. Um, well, but the same principle applies. I mean, I, th I think if you're willing to create a, a cake that says, you know, God hates X, Y, Z, 
um, then you can, you, I mean, that, that also well, involves that depends script. Well, that depends how you define that. Like I said, uh, Mr. Phillips won't make a cake uh, for a gay wedding regardless of who orders it. Or a cake's, you know, uh, it's, it's not uh, the, the customer per se, it's the, it's the cake. He doesn't want to make the cake. Professor, I had a question about your um, point about dignitary harm. So I believe your argument was uh, not that the gay couple couldn't get a cake and that was the problem because clearly they can get a cake elsewhere, but it was the fact that they were asking a craftsman to do something for them and his refusal was, was dignitary harm. But then at the end of your presentation, your fi first 15 minute, you said that someone could be forced, if, if you're correct, uh, to make a cake for the Westwood Baptist Church or the Klein or whatever. How is the dignitary harm of having to work for someone that opposed to you as the Westbrook Baptist Church to a gay baker any less than the harm that someone would suffer by not getting the cake? Well, I think, it dig first of all, I think dignitary harm is only one reason to justify it. I mean, for example, there, I, I distinctly remember CNN going to a small, small town in Georgia and interviewing five different floors in that town. And none of, all of them said, no, we won't, right? So there's an access to, to the commerce issue there. Um, but I, you know, I think that the, the, the bottom line is we've divided, the way we've created these projected classes is to recognize that people who have immute, inalienable traits who are discriminated against because of those traits um, have a different, we have a different view of, of how people treat them in ordinary tra commercial transactions. Um, I don't think that applies, th I mean, I, that does not apply to the Klan, in my view. Um, you know, but it, it does apply to people on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, and so that, that to me, you know, the fact that we've accepted that this is a trait which has no bearing to people's uh, ability to, to be good citizens of society, but yet they're discriminated against because of it, um, makes it both acceptable and, and noble, in my view, to, you know, to outlaw that form of discrimination against them. And, um, you know, if people feel as if their dignity is harmed somehow by serving a same-sex couple, I think tough. Well, there's, you know, Orthodox Christians and Muslims and Jews are also a minority in this country. Um, uh, you know, there's dignity harms going the other way, and uh, I think, you know, you have to distinguish between bigotry and, uh, as, as Kennedy put it, honorable religious or, or philosophical beliefs. Uh, so my question is actually stepping back from um, specifically cakes. Uh, looking at more broader Title VII, um, it's my understanding that Title VII protects religion and sex, but not sexual orientation. And so my question is, do you think it should? Um, and it, like, how big of a difference do you think that would make? And if you think it should, how we get to a place where it does? This is probably the biggest disagreement we'll have all day, I think. Um, I think that sexual orientation discrimination is a form of sex discrimination and is already unlawful under Title VII as the Seventh Circuit has recognized in Hively um, and the Second Circuit has now recognized in Zarda. Um, and so I, you know, I think that it absolutely is already covered. If the Supreme Court, Supreme Court ultimately decides that I'm, that I'm wrong, um, then I think that two things should happen. One, uh, Congress should absolutely amend the Title VII to expressly protect against sexual orientation discrimination and um, gender identity discrimination, and two, um, we cannot have any, you know, whatever religious carve-outs are, are already in place in Title VII uh, for sex discrimination should exist equally with whatever comes into play for sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination. We shouldn't have some extra carve-outs that, you know, that only apply to LGBT people that don't apply, um, you know, on the, on the basis of sex. Wait, wait, carve-outs that apply to LGBT people that don't apply to sex? So when, uh, I guess it was two years ago, three years ago, when they proposed the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, there were additional uh, religious exemptions in that legislation which would only apply to sexual orientation or gender identity claims uh, that did not apply, wouldn't have applied to you know, a, a other sex discrimination claims. So I'd be weary of creating new exemptions that were specific to LGBT claims as opposed to broadly um, you know, applicable. Oh, I'm wary of um, giving more business to trial lawyers, no offense to many of you who might uh, go into plaintiff side work, but uh, um, 
I don't work much in, in, in this area. My colleague Walter Olson, who happens to be gay, is against ENDA because he thinks that uh, the existing laws have been applied in, in ways that have complicated things and that the, um, uh, the actions of the market can take care of uh, most of the problems that, that we have. That this would be overkill. Gender identity, I think, introduces a, a heightened level of uh, complexity that doesn't exist with, uh, with sexual orientation uh, or sex. But um, um, I mean, this is what happens when we're, we're living in a second or third order universe here where you already have government involved in many places where uh, Jim Crow apart, uh, it's probably not needed. I mean, I would, I would be more in favor of removing statutory protections than adding further ones in. Um, I have a question about the standards. Um, for if a person comes up and complains about something being of like a violation of their individual religious belief, how can we ha let courts determine what is a sincere religious belief while being in while maintaining um, the establishment clause and not having like government uh, tribunals that decide what is a true sincere religious belief? There are standards for this. Um, it's you know how long standing is it? Uh, is there any evidence that you've been part of this religion from before when you got into this legal problem that, that takes you before the court? Um, is there any you know you know documented? Uh, you know, there, there's standards of evidence to the same way that courts try to look at sincerity and other you know non-religious claims. Uh, are, is this some you know, pretextual reason that you're conjuring up for doing whatever it is, or, or are you being sincere? But yeah, they, they certainly don't, uh, even if you know, there have been plenty of cases where someone uh, pretty facially, um, you know, the, they try to have like a, a bishop testify that, nope, that's not Catholic teaching, I don't know what this guy's saying, but as long as he's being sincere and it's part of a long-held kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, belief system, you don't have to, the courts won't hold you to some sort of uh, you know what the correct orthodoxy of uh, whatever religion it might be. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm always skeptical of courts getting. I'm I'm skeptical of courts to the extent that they can adequately and fairly always do this the right way, particularly when the religious practices are um, perhaps not what we're used to, right? Um, and so I'm 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 very I'm always nervous that courts aren't culturally competent enough to um, you know, remove themselves and say, well, I'm not used to this. This is, you know, this is a little off to me, and therefore it can't be a legitimate religious practice. Um, you know, versus, you know, if it's something from, you know, uh, you know, religious belief or re religious faith that we're all accustomed to as, as a society, and say, oh, well, yeah, well, of course. Um, so I, I think, you know, my fear is always that courts are, um, you know, maybe a little too dismissive at times of, of what constitutes a legitimate religious practice. Thank you so much for coming. Let's thank our speaker one more time.